for a better understanding of the world around you, for a greater knowledge of the world you live in. Wolf and Dessauer in downtown Fort Wayne and downtown Huntington brings the Screen News Digest, a chapter of living history, into your classroom. Dreams of the dragon are born 30 years ago in the caves of a mountain hideaway in the remote Chinese province of Yenan. A handful of people are gathered here, living a life of primitive hardship. Their leader is Mao Zedong. A man with a plan, a blueprint for the conquest of China. Those who follow Mao are carefully taught. The enemy advances, we retreat. The enemy camps, we harass. The enemy tires, we attack. The enemy retreats, we pursue. This is Mao Zedong's strategy of guerrilla warfare. The tactics of terror studied and learned in Yenan province. Political power, says Mao, grows out of the barrel of a gun. Communism is not love. Communism is the hammer to destroy our enemies. In 1937, Japan launches an all-out war against China. And for eight long years, the land and the people are cruelly punished. As China fights for her very life, the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek must and does accept the support of the communists. So the red guerrillas come down out of the caves of Yenan. But the dreams of the dragon are made very clear by Mao Zedong. Comrades, he says, we are fighting 90% for ourselves and 10% against the Japanese. The ragged communist army, poorly trained, badly equipped, is drilled and armed by nationalist China and the United States. As the war goes on, Mao Zedong is hailed as a popular anti-Japanese patriot, and the Red Guerrillas are cheered as liberators as they help turn the tide of battle against the invaders. When the Japanese surrender in 1945, Mao's guerrillas have grown both in strength and size. The enemy from without has been conquered. The enemy from within has just begun to fight. For post-war China is a land exhausted by battle. Misery and hunger are everywhere. People eat grass because grass is all that they have to eat. This is the time for Mao Zedong and his guerrilla army to speak and to strike. And strike they do out of the barrels of guns in a self-proclaimed war of national liberation. Civil war spreads throughout the country. In an attempt to bring a lasting peace to the troubled land, the United States sends General George C. Marshall to China to meet with both sides. The general proposes a truce and the establishment of a coalition government with nationalist and communist representation. Both sides agree to the Marshall proposal and it is signed. Representing the communists and making his first appearance as a red Chinese leader is Zhou Enlai, a general in Mao's Red Army. The communists have no intention of honoring the agreement that Zhou Enlai signs. 
The truce is part of Mao's philosophy, to fight, fight, talk, 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 fight, fight. The Communist Party, says Mao, must never deviate from conquest or submerge its organization in a united front. The red wave rolls on, sweeping over and across the Chinese mainland. And on November 1st, 1949, the dreams of the dragon have been fulfilled. All of mainland China has been overrun, and one-fourth of the world's population has been brought under absolute communist control. Mao Zedong and his followers have come a long, long way from the caves of Yunnan province. The Red Leader's blueprint for conquest, protracted guerrilla war, united front, elimination of all opposition, has accomplished its aims. Now consolidating his power over China and her people, Mao takes an increasingly militant position against the United States and the free world. And in Korea in 1950, Communist China and the United States come into direct conflict. The confrontation is triggered by the invasion of South Korea by communist troops from the north. The United Nations responds to the aggression and American troops are sent into combat to help defend the sovereignty of South Korea. The GIs and their United Nations allies drive back the North Korean invaders. In heavy fighting, the communists are put to rout and U.S. troops move northward. In November 1950, the Red Chinese intervene on the side of North Korea. For two and one half years, the communists and American troops are locked in battle on the snow-swept slopes of Korea. In July 1953, the fighting ends with a truce that fixes boundary lines much as they were when the fighting began. The United States suffers more than 150,000 casualties, but the freedom of South Korea is preserved. As the communist Chinese troops withdraw to the north and return to their homeland, Mao Zedong claims a momentous victory over the forces of the free world. The United States, he says, is a paper tiger, a reactionary nation destined to be swallowed up one day by a communist revolution that will engulf the earth. In Mao's own words, the seizure of power by armed force, the settlement of issues by war, is the highest form of revolution. The Marxist-Leninist principles of revolution hold good universally for China and for all other countries of the world. So an increasingly aggressive communist China spreads its sphere of influence into countries on all continents. In 1951, red troops march into the peaceful mountain kingdom of Tibet to set up a puppet government controlled by Peking. In 1959, when the freedom-loving people of Tibet rise in revolt, the communists crush the uprising, killing thousands and imprisoning thousands more. Many of the fiercely independent people of Tibet flee their homeland and find sanctuary in neighboring India. Here they can live and labor in peace. The dragon's shadow and the dragon's dreams are spreading across Asia to reach into the subcontinent to touch the fate and future of India. Prime Minister Nehru and his daughter, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, are welcomed warmly by Zhou Enlai on a goodwill visit to Peking. The Red Chinese are seeking, by peaceful means, a stronger link, a closer bond between the world's two most populous nations. 
For Mao Zedong's China is inhabited by 660 million people, and Pandit Nehru's India is populated by 480 million. Together, these two countries account for almost half the world's population. And yet, in 1963, Red China turns on her neighbor, launching a series of border raids on India. Mao Zedong is carrying out the Communist Manifesto that declares that goals and gains of world revolution justify any means, any time, anywhere. In 1965, on the 20th anniversary of the end of World War II, Mao Zedong issues a new blueprint for world conquest. He calls North America and Western Europe the cities of the world, and Asia, Africa, and Latin America the rural areas. Communists from every continent are told that today's world revolution involves, in Mao's words, the encirclement of the cities by the rural areas. All communist countries should regard it as their sacred duty, says Mao, to support the revolutionary struggle of the National Liberation Front in Vietnam. China, he adds, will do everything in its power to assist the Viet Cong until every single American is driven out of Vietnam. In the final analysis, the communist leader points out, the whole cause of world socialism hinges on the revolutionary struggles of the Asian, African, and Latin American peoples who make up the overwhelming majority of the world's population. With revolutions organized everywhere, with protracted wars of national liberation, united fronts, the elimination of all opposition, there will be a torrential tide of opposition to the United States and her allies. And the philosophy of Mao Zedong concludes, the nations of the free world can be divided up and defeated. This today is Communist China's new and global manifesto, militant and menacing. The dreams of the dragon spoken in Peking thunder out of Asia and echo around the world. To widen your horizons, to stimulate your interest in things going on about you, Wolf and Dessauer, one of America's great department stores, has presented the Screen News Digest as a public service.